we're going to turn our volume up a little teeny bit. Good morning. Wow, that's really close. There we go. That's better. Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing this fine and rainy day? Hopefully it's the last rainy day we have for a while, and we get to see some sunshine tomorrow. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, come on in if you're in the lobby. So you guys, a little more than a week ago, Fran Poff passed away, and she was my mother-in-law for the last 33 years. Um, she was 89 years old and absolutely ready to go. Um, the Evite invitation to her 90th birthday went out on the day that she died. Um, she was sitting in her chair with a little notepad with names written on it and things she wanted to do for the party. And she had a picture frame sitting next to her chair that the family constantly put new pictures on so she could see the family's faces on a regular basis. And both she and her husband, Dud, who's preceded her to heaven um, by a few years, their lives were all about people. <laughs> She just loved people. She was not focused on the material stuff of this world or on looking a certain way or traveling all over the place. Her focus, and his focus too, was on the people in their lives, the ever-changing large family that they had, the patients that, Je that Dud was a doctor for for over 50 years or about 50 years in Newport Beach, the large network of friends, their church family, the friends of their kids, the friends of their grandkids, the friends of their great grandkids, that's who they focused their lives on, and Fran in particular. She was truly one of the friendliest people I have ever known in my entire life, and I am not a super friendly person, and so I, I love that about her. In fact, Christina and several other people shared with Scott and I that they, she was the first person that they met when they came to Grace. Um, she and Dad were official, they were unofficial greeters before we actually had official greeters here at Grace. Um, they made people feel special by a smile, a warm, hand, or a warm handshake, or a hug. Um, they were in charge, actually, of the Olin Mills photo book here at Grace. Remember the old, old, photo, old photo books, the Olin Mills family photos? And they did that so that they could get to know people. That's why they volunteered to do that. Um, and so that they could welcome people into this church family. Um, Fran always had a little notebook with her at every one of my kids' games. So she would write down the names of the kids and their cap number, because my kids played water polo. And she wanted to know, she didn't keep stats in that little notebook, she kept names. And so that when the kids got out of the water, she could say, oh my gosh, Mary Rose, what a great game you had. Or, gosh, Sarah, you did so good in goal today. Um, and it was just amazing that she did that. She also was known for sending greeting cards to everyone. She, you probably, many of you probably received cards from her. She sent birthday cards and anniversary cards and um, condolence cards and every card in between. And she sent so many cards that Dad said, you've got you've to cut this. This is so expensive. You cannot possibly keep sending this many cards. And rather than stopping sending cards, she actually got a job at Newport Hills Drugs so that she could get a discount on the cards, and so, <laughs> which is great. Um, one of the first times I met Fran, I was a senior in high school, and my friend Amy Beck, who is now Amy Lawrence, and I were teaching the freshman girls Bible study through Mariner's um, youth group. And the youth group was looking for a place for the freshman girls Bible study to be hosted in Harbor View, and Fran put up her hand and said, I'm happy to host that. Well, Fran had four boys, none of whom were living at home, but she hosted the freshman girls Bible study in her home. Um, last week I received a text from a friend offering her condolences on our loss of Fran, and the same week she also, her husband lost his aunt. Um, and she ended the text with the phrase, life is indeed a vapor. And that phrase has just been rolling around in my head all week. 
what does that mean? You know, what, what does that mean that life is a vapor? And it's really caused me to reflect. Well, that phrase is actually comes from James 4, 13 and 14, which says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will travel to such and such city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be, for you are like a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Time is precious. We are fragile. Life is short. Eternity is long. Every minute counts. And what we do with the life here is really what has resonated with me. At some point, we're all going to come before the Lord and sit down, and we want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, don't we? I believe that Fran's life was well lived. Her life was not marked by her travels to such and such a city or running a business or making a profit. She wasn't obsessed with her outward appearance, as Christina will teach about this morning. But Fran focused her attention outward on loving people, welcoming people, knowing people, um, and serving the people in her life. And today, she is living out the hope that we all profess, the hope of eternity. Um, and while I'm certain that she is at the pearly gates, if they, if they actually do exist, um, welcoming all the new arrivals with a smile and a hug, um, I also know that she's sitting at Jesus' feet, and he is saying, you loved people well. Well done, good and faithful servant. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, what a beautiful life Fran lived. Um, I can learn a lot from her, and I have learned a lot from her. God, welcome her into your kingdom with warm, loving arms as she will welcome those who can follow her. Um, God, thank you for the promise that we have of heaven. Thank you that she's living out the hope that we profess. Bless this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have the honor and privilege of introducing a friend who I have known for many years and is her first year here at Abide, and I'm so excited to hear from Diane Cotton this morning. So welcome, Diane. It's been many years, has it? has been. This is fun. Good morning. Well, when I was asked to do this, I thought, I have some really big shoes to fill. All of our spotlights have been so powerful and so wonderful and so meaningful that I thought, oh boy, how am I going to do this? I thought of Allie and her heart rocks that she would find along the way on her walks as a of encouragement from the Lord when she was going through a tough season. I thought of Doreen when the Lord connected the dots for her between her mom's death and her own birth. That was so precious and amazing. And then I thought of Arlene, what I call the stair story now, I'll never forget it, <laughs> where through her, her hearing from the Lord and in radical obedience, Followed, uh, followed that, what she heard, and the results are amazing. All of these stories have been so amazing. I remember uh, Allie's story, or I'm pointing it out rather, because I think the Lord just shows his kindness to us in, in so many special ways like that. I thought of Doreen because our Lord plays the long game. You know, she, she was able to go back and actually connect the dots from her own birth. And I thought of Arlene because of her radical obedience. All these things um, happen when you live a life with God. And who here wants more of that? I mean, I want more of that, and I want it more every day. About five years ago, I was feeling like, eh, wasn't really getting that. I, something was missing. I, uh, I, I looked around and I see that others had had what I was looking for. I knew it was possible. I knew it was available. 
but I wasn't experiencing it myself. And fortunately, my husband was sort of feeling the same way. So about five years ago, we went on what I call a spiritual walkabout. We left church, and we tried many other churches. We read books, and the books were great. The other churches were great but none of them really gave me that extra, you know, secret sauce I was looking for. Went to a lot of Christian conferences, love me a Christian conference. Uh, nope, they were great, learned a lot, but wasn't there. And I made a lot of new, really great friends. And to this day are great friends, but that wasn't quite it either. All these were really important and really meaningful, but none of these I, I, at the time, I used the term spiritual transformation. I was looking for spiritual transformation. And uh, it was like I was looking for love in all the wrong places <laughs> because I found that, um, that, that none of these so-called solutions were, were the answer. So out of really sheer frustration, I just decided to sit down at the feet of Jesus as often as I could. I prayed with him, I worshiped him, I adored him, I cried with him, laughed with him, journaled with him. And I just also just sat there in silence, waiting to hear back from him. And then some wonderful things started to happen. And that was a spoiler alert, by the way, because that is the answer. Um, I started in, in my journeys throughout my days, starting to see his fingerprints on everything. I started to go from what I really felt was knowing a lot about God and to knowing God. And I felt like a real intimate relationship was emerging. I felt like I had come off the bleachers and stepped onto the playing field. And he was there at his feet that I actually found what I was looking for. And I also learned that I was kind of putting the cart before the horse for searching for spiritual transformation because it wasn't about me. We've all heard that before, right? It was about getting to know him. And everything else would flow out intimately after uh, our relationship deepened. I really felt like he was growing me up. And believe me, under this colored hair, I have a lot of gray ones. <laughs> and so that feeling of, of growing up was, was really great and really so special. Um, I guess this kind of makes sense, though, because in our natural life, uh, we don't read about our husbands or our best friends if we want to get to know them. You know, we don't just check out their Facebook page or their Instagram posts. And we don't just ask other friends about them. We actually spend time. And there is really kind of no getting around that. And I'm sorry for you younger moms in the audience who probably want to throw rotten eggs at me right now because time is the one thing you don't have. But the result of spending time with God is everything. And you, again, can relate that back to the relationships in your own life when you spend time with your husband, your kids, your, your friends, and how those relationships deepen through time and, and shared experience. So there's no shortcut to that, and I, uh, but I urge you to consider that spending time uh, the benefits of that will far outweigh any sacrifices you will probably have to make. Getting up earlier, going to bed later, um, it's just so worth it. And so I have a little story, a little testimony of my own to uh, let you know what one of the benefits uh, of, of my journey in this way is. And it was funny because I was thinking about telling the story and I realized I, I started this jewelry company in the year 2000, and in that year, I was asked to speak at a Grace Women's Retreat 
about the founding of my company and what it meant at that time. I think it's the last time I had a microphone in my hand. Um, but uh, it's, it's just so full circle now, plays the long game, um, to, to be able to share something about it with you now. Am I? OK. Um, so uh, I love making jewelry, absolutely love it. I could do it 24-7. And I had done it happily for 20 years. And long about the beginning of 2019, the Lord said, time to make a change. We're going to do things differently. And I was like, no. <laughs> I don't want to. Um, he said, yep. He said, you don't have to retire, but we are going to do things differently, and you can take the year to do it, but I want you to close down your showroom in New York, close down your showroom in L.A., um, release your sales reps, and uh, you're just going to have to trust me. So I took to about December 28th. <laughs> I really did took, take the whole year. And uh, I got on that plane coming back from my favorite city, New York, and I, I needed to be talked down off a ledge by several friends. It was really tough for me. And, but I did it, and I was proud, radical obedience. Um, that was my, my one experience with that. Oh, you know, and after that, definitely not, not the last, I'm sure. Because two months later, COVID hit. I had no showroom lease rents to pay. I had no inventory stocked up that I had to worry about unloading. I had no sales reps to be responsible for and, and have to pay. I had no trips to cancel. I could not have been in a better position facing the onset of COVID. It was I get chills every time I think about it, and I try to tell the story as often as I can, because when you, when you really have a deep, intimate relationship with the Lord, you, you gain trust, your faith increases, and you hear him. Maybe not the audible voice of God, I still have yet to experience that, but you get a real impression and knowing of what he wants you to do. And so that's my pitch. Um, it, uh, to sum it all up, I think you know when, when the phone rings and your husband or your best friend calls and you know in 0.2 seconds who it is and you know what mood they're in. <laughs> that's what happens when you spend time sitting at the feet of Jesus, when you spend time with the Lord. That's the knowing that comes when you set aside time just for him. And you too will be able, if you, if you feel like you have a little bout of spiritual mediocrity going on in your life right now, or you're feeling a little stagnant, I'm here to t tell you to try this. You start seeing in color instead of black and white. I I'm not exaggerating. You really do. And um, it's just so very worth it. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, seeing in color. I love that. Yeah, let me pray for you. Thank you. Oh God, thank you so much for Diane and for her story. Um, can I think about just sitting at your feet, Jesus, and that we can know you and that you want us to know you and that you will change us when we just know you. And um, God, thank you for a, a changed life. Thank you for your provision for Diane in her company, God. But also just thank you for, her, for your provision in her life. Just for your just outpouring of love towards her. What a, great, um, what a great gift you've given her. So thank you for her story, God. And thank you for what you will continue to do through her. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Well, this morning we have Christina speaking to us on imperishable beauty, which is an interesting title for this passage. Um, anyway, um, 
I, I digress. Let me, um, let me open up, uh, let's open up our books to page 63 and let me read this passage for us to start the morning. First Peter 3, 1 through 7 says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Our song this morning is by Ben Fuller and it is called, Who Am I? Amen. Do I have a little feedback here? Yep, a lot of feedback. Um, so it's so funny, I was thinking, okay, either the rain is going to keep people away this morning or our topic. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just want to say uh, Gina and Diane, already the most meaningful morning. We could stop right there. I just feel like that was such a blessing. So thank you to both of you. Um, I would love to just open in prayer. Uh, Father, we invite you here right now with us. We ask that you would be informing our understanding of this passage, that no human, that it wouldn't be human desires, longings, understandings, knowledge, that it would truly be spirit-led by you to understand what it is your heart for, is for us as women. Uh, God, we just invite you here now and we say, come and speak to us. Show us your way. Show us your way as women who love you. Lord, we are your children. We pray this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to tell you a little story about a captain of a ship. It was a really dark night. It was very foggy. And uh, this captain was driving a ship that was fairly large. And he saw in the distance a faint light off ahead. And it was super foggy. So he ended up saying to his signalman, can you send a message to that light? I guess they have a way to do that. I'm not a seaman. I don't know. Send a message to the person and say, can you alter your course 10 degrees south? Right? And so he received a message back. And the message said, actually, alter your course 10 degrees north. And he's like, nah. -uh. Um, so he, he got a little angry and he's like, come on now. I want you. And he says to the guy, the guy, tell him now, I am a captain. Alter your course 10 degrees south. And the guy responds and says, I am a seaman, but I still think you need to alter your course 10 degrees north. Um, and uh, he was unwilling to change course. He was so frustrated by this. He kept going and going, and then all of a sudden he's saying, alter your course, course south, I am a battleship. So he's basically saying, I'm going to war with you if you don't alter your course, and as he's saying this, he begins to crash into rocks, and shipwreck because it was a lighthouse that was telling him you need to alter your course north. <laughs> but he was unwilling to submit. Every part of him, whether it was his ego or whatever it was, he was unwilling to submit. And let's just say, we don't like this word, submission. Um, we, it's a dirty word. In fact, I was talking to my mom last night. It's her birthday today, so shout out to my mom. Um, and I was talking to my mom last night, and, and I was telling her I'm going to be teaching on 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. It's the passage about wives submit to your husbands. And she goes, I don't care for that passage at all. <laughs> I said, you and me both, mom, you and me both. Um, so this passage taps into stuff for us. If not maybe everybody, but it certainly does for me. So I'm not going to say it does for you. It taps into a lot for me. It taps into my desire for control. It taps into my ego. 
it taps into what I feel like maybe culture is, is doing and it feels like, are, why are we behind the times? Whatever I want to say, I have wrestled with this text a lot. Um, and I want this morning to go where the text takes us, not where my desires take us. And sometimes those things don't go in the same direction. And I have to say that when I was writing the study guide um, in this passage, I started to just sweat <laughs> as I was reading it. And I was thinking, okay, I better be the one that teaches on that. That sweating is usually the indicator. You got something to tend to, Christina. Um, so here we are. Uh, we're going to answer a couple questions today. And I want to look at, you can put those up. I want to look at a couple questions today, and hopefully we'll answer these, or we'll just stir up more thoughts about them, and then we can talk about them in our small groups. Because I'm actually still wrestling with this text a bit, even as I stand before you. So, um, what is biblical submission? Is the call to submit to our husbands still relevant today? What does it mean to have a gentle, quiet spirit? Does this passage prohibit outward adornment? Um, why the example of Sarah? What does a weaker vessel mean? And what does this passage express about God's view of women? Whew. <laughs> that feels like quite an undertaking to me, but we're going to try to go there today. So here we go. We have this passage, an overview of the passage is we have a call for wives to submit to their husbands. We're going to actually spend most of our time there, even though I titled this Imperishable Beauty. Um, we're going to spend most of our time on this topic of submission then we'll talk about beauty a little bit. And then it has a call to husbands. And I am going to mention it, but we're not going there, mostly because we're a room full of women. But not because it's not relevant to us. It is relevant. But because we are a room full of women, I've decided to focus on those other two things. All right, so let's see where this goes. Submission. What is submission? So if I looked in the dictionary, there are some answers that I didn't like. So I just threw those out, right? <laughs> I can't do that with God's word, but I can do that with the dictionary, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I looked in the dictionary, and one of the, one of the uh, d definitions was yielding control to another entity. Yielding control to another entity. Uh, the other was to order under. So I liked the word order, to order under. That's how those would be de defined by uh, the Bible. So let's look at this passage and the overarching arc of what we've been reading in 1 Peter. And we realize the whole thing Peter's doing right now is he wants us to be women. Or he wants us to be people, but he wants us to be people with submissive hearts, ultimately submitted to him. That is what he is longing for. That is what he is speaking into. It's what Terry talked about two weeks ago, is that when, you, when he's bringing up all these different, co these different contexts, he wants us to have hearts submitted to him first and foremost. And I, I would even put a period there. All of these other contexts are out of a heart that's submitted to him. And it's important to note that submission is, a, is an important biblical posture throughout scripture. I'm going to actually point out a few ways that we see it. Jesus actually, you can, Jesus actually submitted to his parents, it says in Luke. Citizens submit to the government, as we learned about from Terry. Servants submit to masters, as Terry talked about. Christians are called to submit to church leaders. Unseen spiritual beings submit to Jesus. By the way, that's our text next week, and it's got some craziness to it. So a lot of, a lot of people don't know quite what that means, but unspiritual beings submit to Jesus. Um, the universe submits to Jesus. The church submits to Jesus, and Christians submit to God. These are all throughout Scripture. And interestingly, on none of these is the order reversed. So that was always the way that order went. Um, and so order is a part of God's design. He is a God of order. In fact, when there's chaos, you can probably guess that it is not his work because he is a God of order. Um, so he wants to bring order. So then we have this wives submit to husbands in the context of these other passages on submission. And uh, it's, again, telling us submit to the authorities in your life. Out of a submissive heart to me, submit, God's saying, out of a submissive heart to me, submit to the authorities in your life. As Terry shared, um, not my will, but yours be done, Lord. When we yield to our control to the established authorities of our life, we're submitting to him. So submission, as much as we hate the word and it's a dirty word, is a virtue to pursue. 
just in general. It's a, a virtue to pursue. Um, so let's look at submission in the cultural context of this passage. I think it's important to note that Peter's intent, and Terry touched on this last time, is he's not trying to make cultural arguments about authority in these passages. What he's trying to do is talk to our hearts and have our hearts changed within the culture that we're in. And so when he's speaking to these things, he's not, he's not trying to shape culture. So he's not saying slavery is wrong or right. He's saying slavery exists, and this is how I, want you to ex how I want you to walk in that, okay? So we're looking at this, and we're going, okay, slavery last week, he wasn't arguing against, against or for slavery, though I think he would be against it. Um, he was just challenging the heart's posture. So in marriage, in antiquity, husbands were clearly the established authority in the house. Clearly, right? So there was a very patriarchal society to the point where women were almost treated as slaves. So we know this to be true. So now we're going to look at what's asked of being a, of a woman in this passage. In marriage, it says, submit to your own husband. I want to point out, it's not submit to every man. It says, submit to your own husband. There's an order that's being established in the household, clearly referencing an authority within the house. So it's not universal when we talk about, oh, you must submit. It's not, if you're not married, by all means, you're free. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lucky you. No. <laughs> But it's not a universal here, women submit to men. But we see in other contexts in scripture that, that God provides order where it does have gender play out. But we're, we're not going there to this morning, right? Okay. Um, so this is a principle for the home. And then he goes on to talk about Sarah. And I, this is where I was really like, oh goodness. Okay, what do I do with this? Sarah obeyed. That was a really hard word for me, by the way, more so than submission. Sarah obeyed Abraham. Now, we need to keep in mind that Sarah was the matriarch of the Jewish people. Um, but it's important to know that when people of Jewish descent heard Sarah's story, they knew it through and through, right? When we hear that, we're like, oh, she obeyed. Well, we need to understand the context that Sarah, there were many times that Sarah did obey her husband, if we want to use that word, or she submitted to him. And um, the biggest being, and this is probably the ones they, that would have been in their mind, is that she left their homeland when God asked Abraham to go. And she said yes, and she went. And that would have been hard to do. And we see later, in a, later it talks about a fearlessness. She did it without fear. She went when she, when she was asked. But there were times that she didn't do what Abraham asked her to do. And this is clear in scripture. Um, Abraham, um, Abraham actually agreed to do things Sarah asked him to do, just so you know. Um, she said, can you take Hagar, this is a terrible one, can you take Hagar as your handmaiden and have a child? And he did it. <laughs> so great, Sarah, cool, good, good job. <laughs> um, and then there was a time when uh, God uh, commanded, commanded Abraham to do what Sarah had asked of him. And that was to banish Hagar and Ishmael. And God told him to do as Sarah had said. So you see that there's a mutuality of relationship here happening. Um, it's not that just everything Abraham said goes, right? So we see that there's, there's, there's things happening here, but clearly... What this passage is saying is Sarah had an attitude and a posture of honor and yielding to her husband. A humility of spirit toward him. A respect. Um, we see other passages in scripture that also call us to the same thing. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord is Colossians 3.18. This is Paul. And he's, he's uh, expressing the same thing as Peter, right? So then that leads me to go, um, let's see, where am I in my notes? Um, that leads me to ask the question, is this authority that we're hearing of, is this simply because men were an established authority back then? 
Is he just speaking to this because that was the culture then, like slavery, and so we are just, he's, we're freed from that because we're not in that culture anymore, and so we don't have to, I mean, that would be a real question, right? Is this just a cultural thing that was happening then, and he was telling them to submit to the authority? This is where the text takes me. I hope you go with me. <laughs> um, it's a reasonable argument to argue that, but Christ... Um, And Paul and Peter, they clearly talk about there is a mystery to marriage itself. Um, In Ephesians 5, 22 to 23, it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, own husbands, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, if we were going to say, well, the headship is just about that culture, we would probably then have to say from this passage, the Christ's headship of the church was just about that culture too. And we can't say that. Because we see that the headship of Christ is foundational to our entire faith journey, right? That he has this relationship with the church as he is the, he is the head he is the, and we are the bride. And there's a beautiful mystery that is talked about that somehow our marriages are intended to reflect that. Um, in Ephesians 5.32, it actually says this This is in the same passage just on, it talked about husbands too, just so you know, not just wives. Um, This is a profound mystery when I'm talking about marriage, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So this headship, I don't think we can just throw it out and say it was cultural. So then we got to wrestle with it. (laughs) What does it actually mean? Um, the, and I just want to point out, if the, he, if, the, if the husband is the head, he carries a deep, deep responsibility. It's massive. Um, but we're not going there today. We're talking about us women. <laughs> but I also want to show that um, having headship does not cancel out mutuality, a mutuality of love, a mutuality of respect, a mutuality of servanthood. Because actually, at the beginning of this very passage in Ephesians, we have Ephesians 5.21 that says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. So the husband has a mutuality of submission happening here. So what we're trying to tease out is, what is this headship thing? What, what is this? Because Christ is still the head of the church. I'm going to uh, step out and say what I think submission is not. We'll start there, okay? Um, I don't think submission is always agreeing with your husband. I don't think submission is denying your own will or thoughts. I don't think submission is rejecting your own strength. We'll talk about that in a minute. I don't think it's fearing your husband. If we're talking about reverent fear, maybe that's a different thing, but even that feels wrong in this context. I think that's reserved for God. It's not avoiding being persuasive with your husband. I'm sure Sarah was very persuasive with her husband. Um, It's not oppression. And it's not putting your husband's will above Christ's. That will always supersede, right? So if we talk about that's what submission is not, I'm imagining that on that list there are some things where you're like, I've kind of come to believe that that's what submission meant. Like I, I, he says something, I'm supposed to do it. There might be some of us in that room who have wrestled with that. I don't think that that's what we're being asked to do. I think what we're being called into is an attitude and a posture toward our husband that is one of respect and honor. And I love the word yielding that came from the dictionary. It's a yielding. It's almost saying, I will just, I will put myself under you. But we have a mutuality here. So even though I'm, it's like a self-humbling. Now, is he called to the same thing? I actually think he is. But I still think there's a role. (laughs) that he has. Um, it's, not about, it's not about decision making. I often hear people say, well, 
the, the, the husband's the head of the household, we disagreed on something, so he just gets the final say. I actually think that's not correct. I don't think that, that's what this passage is saying. Um, I think that it's saying that the posture that we carry it toward our husband should be one of a, of a humble, submitted yielding. And again, we're not getting into what he's called to, and he's called to a whole heck of a lot, right? So I asked Drake, my husband, um, how does this play out in our marriage? And he's like, oh, I don't want to have this conversation. <laughs> it felt very risky to him. Um, and the first thing he goes, uh, he says, you know, your personality, you are just naturally more a stronger personality and you are more uh, inclined to assert yourself, all of those things. And he goes, and that's how God made you and it's a beautiful thing, oh, right? Wow. That's beautiful, right? <laughs> um, so he's like, by personality, you are just more inclined to take the lead. Um, so how does then that, we have an interesting dynamic, right? Then how does this play out? Um, and he said, um, he said that there are certain times when there are things that I, he knows I really would want, but out of a deference and love for him, and what he's expressed, I just don't pursue that. So a case in point is, um, <laughs> this feels, he um, has had, a, a, how would I say, he's had kind of a hard, maybe that, he wouldn't use that word. He's had, uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> this is what, this is, <laughs> no. <laughs> this is the problem when you don't write down every word you say, right? <laughs> Um, he has had um, in, his, um, uh, in his work, he's kind of had a hard journey in his work just throughout. And there have been many times when I have been like, I would just go in there and I'd be like, <laughs> whatever it is, right? And it's really frustrating to me because I want to move the ball forward in a way that he's actually not inclined to do. And he's more willing to sit back and, and actually say, I'm trusting God with this. Ah, what a concept, right? Um, <laughs> and, and so I, I, I feel all this internal tension, right, over the ways that he's maybe navigating this because it's not how I would do it. But what he said is there's never a time when I've actually pushed him to try to do it a different way that I have actually, and it's meant hard things for our family. It's meant hard for him to sit in it a little longer than I would like, right? And so he knows that he said it's not that it's not without cost. It's cost to us as a family. Um, but he's like, he, I have just respected that he, that is, he is one, and not all of us can say this about our husbands, I can trust that he is wanting to listen to God and be led by him which is a gift I have as a wife, but also just that he's a different person than I am and that I just, I just kind of take a chill on those things. Um, now, then I said, <laughs> I said, what are some ways I haven't been submissive? <laughs> Who asks that? <laughs> now he's like, hey, now I'm sweating, I'm out. He's like, I'm not telling any of those stories. No, you guys, I really struggle. I mean, I, I'm going to just tell you. Like, I look at this passage, and I'm like, this is a struggle for me. Like, what? Um, but I think when I think about it, that's why I'm like, we don't have things. He, he also said, oh, we always have a mutuality to our relationship. And that's really vital. That is so what this Ephesians passage is also talking about. Um, and we're working through things together. We're trusting, we're trusting the work of God in one another's lives. And it's not like he's ever been like, well, I made a decision and you have to do it. I think then he would be missing the mark of what God's calling him to. <laughs> um, so there's that. But um, what I will say is um, I have... I came up with my own. <laughs> um, there's, I, so I handle our finances in our home. Is that weird too? Sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, you guys. It's okay. <laughs> um, and I had come to him and there was something that I really wanted to give to. And it was a significant amount that I wanted us to potentially think about giving to this organization. Um, and I said, hey, what do you think about doing this? And I already in my mind, I was kind of already way down the path of doing this. So then he says to me, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Like, I really want to think about it. I want to pray about it. I'm not sure that's where I want to go. 
And um, I ended up getting an email probably a week later. And forgive me, and I really mean this, I didn't really pay attention to that conversation. And I ended up just giving the money. Now, I confess that I almost want to cry. And he said to me, I had to go later, when he found out, and I was like, I'm so sorry, I just gave him money. You had told me that you were not sure, and I don't know what it was, I just did it. And he's like, that actually does feel really disrespectful to me. Um, And it feels like you weren't, you know, you you charged ahead, right? And he's, and, and you know what? I, so I confess, I did that, but that was not, I was not submitting. And he's not even a heavy-handed person. I just charged ahead, right? Um, and I think this is where it plays out. That's just a mutual, I wasn't respecting him. I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I, I, he said something, and it's like, I didn't even like, I didn't even allow it to, 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 to sit in there because I had already kind of been around along that path, even though I asked him. So that was a very specific thing where I was like, I, I just, it wasn't, it wasn't good relationship, first of all, we can just talk about that. We, we could even take the word submission out, but I wasn't, I didn't have a submitted, a submitted heart. I wasn't respecting him, I wasn't yielding to him, I was just kind of going the path I wanted, right? Um, these aren't about, and, and the other thing is he wasn't like, well, I'm not going to do it. And, blah, blah. and then he's like, hey, I, and then sweetly, he's like, hey, I trust that that's where the money is supposed to be since that's what happened. Um, but uh, submission, this is, a, it, I, I'm still working it out, you guys. I'm still working it out as to what it means to do this in a marriage relationship. But what I can tell you is I'm confident it's about the posture of our heart toward our spouse. That's it. It's not about the, 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 the little nitty gritty t- details. Every marriage is so different. Who, who has the more assertive personality and who doesn't, right? Those, the, every marriage is so different, but it's about the posture of our heart toward our husband. And ultimately, God is saying, when you submit to your husband with this posture of love and respect and honor and yielding, you are submitting to me. That is what you're doing. So I also want to talk about, um, in this passage, this idea of how God values women. And I will tell you that in my whole life journey, I've really wrestled through some of this stuff um, from a young age. Um, And I just want to tell you, I look at this passage and I see, oh my gosh, God does value us so much when we look at so many other aspects of the context of this. So the first thing is, and this is where I've struggled, is I think it's incorrect to equate authority with greater value. But we do it all the time in our society. God does not do that. He does not look at you and say, oh, you've got, you're more valuable because you've got a little bit more authority. He does, he does not do that. We are all equally valuable in his sight. But in our society, authority equals importance. And so we, we have decided that that's the more valuable person because they have greater importance because they have authority. Um, I think it's a lie we've been taught. It's not true. We can submit with equal importance, dignity, honor, and respect, um, whatever the authority. Okay, so there's that. that was, that's something I've wrestled with a lot. The other thing is, Peter's addressing women. Can I just say, women were not addressed this way before. In that culture, that was unheard of for him to even address the women because they didn't have value. And he's saying, you have so much value, I'm going to speak into your life and into your roles here. Um, He also was encouraging husbands to value and respect their wives, and that was culturally not what people did. They were like property. So he's saying, women are so valuable, you need to respect them, you need to love them, you need to care for them. And then this is profound to me. He calls us co-heirs. Was a woman ever an heir to anything in that society? Not a thing. And he's saying, we are co-heirs. We have just as much value. And then we have this weaker vessel comment, right? Um, As a kid, that just used to make me cringe through and through. (laughs) I want to be strong. I don't want to be weak. Um, But we need to take it in context. And every single thing I read said this weaker vessel comment has to do with our physical 
our physical bodies. And that's all it's speaking to. And that, that, then there's a vulnerability when we aren't as strong physically. Now, we're in a world that would argue that. We've got all sorts of things happening in that realm, right? Um, obviously, the trans transgender issue is highlighting these differences because you've got um, men who are swimming with women and they're, they're beating them. And so, uh, you know, sorry, I don't want to get into all of that. It's just been really highlighted right now. Okay, but what we know is that there is actually a physical constitution to men that generally speaking, they're stronger in their facility, in their body, right? Um, there are those who don't fit. I would take Jesse Graff up against any guy any day and I think, do you guys know who Jesse Graff is? She's, no? Oh, I'm so sad. Mm. <laughs> yeah, she's a ninja warrior, just saying. <laughs> You put her up against any man and she can, she can destroy him. No. Um, <laughs> not that I don't delight in that at all, right? Um, so obviously there are exceptions to this, but generally speaking, we are weaker in facility. And I think when we deny that, we're denying something really silly because we just are. We are weaker in our facility, generally speaking, though there are differences. So when, he's, when, when Peter calls us a weaker vessel, he's, that's not about importance. That's just his reality. He's just saying, actually, you need to take care of them and love them more because they have vulnerabilities because they are the weaker vessel. The facility is weaker. Okay. Are you guys hanging with me? Yes. All right. Okay. All right. I think I'm sweating a lot up here right now going, okay, who's like so over this conversation? But okay. <laughs> We're going to totally shift gears now because we got through submission. Phew, we're through it. Okay. No. <laughs> um, this passage also talks about beauty. And what's interesting is that uh, a wife who's submitting to her husband is deemed beautiful. So that's part of the beauty. That's one of the ways we can adorn ourselves, it says. Um, but we see in this passage, it talks about beauty. And for us, it's such a paradigm shift. And we know this. We know that our world, the values of our world, what they say is beautiful, is so tweaked. It's so off based on what God values and what he says is beautiful. Um, it says in this passage, fading beauty is hairstyles. I think we've all got them. Um, hairstyles, gold jewelry, fine clothes. There are others we could add like makeup, beauty products, plastic surgery. Um, we could add all of those. He's, he's, so the question is, is he saying don't adorn yourselves with those? No, no. He's saying that should definitely not be of great value to you versus juxtaposed to what I'm doing in your heart to the character I want to develop in you. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We know that we're in a society where outward beauty is so elevated. It's so, it's, it's on steroids. Uh, I was just hearing, maybe this is old news to you, but I was just hearing about this thing that's going to tell you how symmetrical your face is because the more symmetrical it is, the more beautiful it is. Apparently, this is the thing right now. The symmetrical face is beautiful. So you have these apps that will tell you how symmetrical it is and you can try to even work with makeup and other things and plastic surgery to try to make your face more symmetrical so that you're more beautiful, right? <laughs> and it's interesting, I Thank you. All right. So um, we, have these, uh, we have these different ways that they're saying what makes us beautiful, right? Um, and I had a friend who lived in Washington, D.C., and she moved to California. And I remember her saying, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., she felt really beautiful. 
but not very smart. And when she moved to California, <laughs> and when she moved to California, she felt not very beautiful, but very smart. <laughs> tell you I think we're in this we we're like the frogs in the pot we don't realize but we are like we are in the heat when it comes to beauty and stuff like we're in the fire right um, and uh, so we have such a skewed um, we have such a skewed investment and I caught myself going it's I'm 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 misinvesting I'm regularly misinvesting and by the way I don't even try that hard but I'm still regularly misinvesting <laughs> Um, but no, I, I think the, our time, our energy, our money, it's so off kilter in the ways that we invest because we are caring so much about that outward appearance. Um, and he's saying, no, I have so much more for you. I want you to value what I value, and I want you to value it above these other things. That is what's beautiful. And I feel like I want us to keep, I want us to be the type of people that are affirming that kind of beauty in one another. That we're regularly, rather than, it's like, oh, I love your shoes. I love the way that you talk to that person. I loved the way that you loved your husband. I love, those are the things we should, I think we can even begin changing that just by affirming those things in one another, right? So this passage gives us a, a, a picture of what this unfading or what this imperishable, be beautiful, uh, imperishable beauty looks like. And it has a couple things. The first one was actually the submissive spirit. But the second one is this gentle, quiet spirit. And again, this is one that makes me go, ha, 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 because I am known to be quite loud. <laughs> and uh, I, and uh, I don't know if um, gentle would be what people would generally use to describe me. So then I'm going, is this about personality? Absolutely not. So what is this about? You can take a woman who has great, great strength and is loud, and she can still be a gentle, quiet spirit. So how? The question is, um, I think gentleness is a, a better word for that there would be meek. And meek is bridled strength. It doesn't mean you don't have strength. It means that you bridle it. It means you know where to use it and when to use it and how to use it. And so to be gentle is to have your strength, but know, actually, actually, I love what you said, Diane, being attuned to God's heart, listening to him, so you actually even know when to use that strength. It's bridled, it's meek. And then quiet, I think a better word for quiet might be peaceful. And what's interesting is my husband is a... Um, He's a theologian in historical Christianity, so he understands the culture quite a bit. And he said, this is a really interesting one because women were feeling their newfound freedom and value in this time, actually, and they were creating a little bit of chaos. And so what's, what he's saying is, don't, you, don't be peaceful. Don't create chaos. Don't be disruptive. Don't let your freedom that you have in Christ bring chaos and disruption. Actually, let it be part of what brings peace. And I can tell you, you can have any personality and be somebody then who is meek and peaceful or gentle and quiet. Um, it also says, I want you to be holy women. This is part of the beauty in verse 5. That means set apart. Um, Seeking the righteousness of Christ. It said that the, the women of old, they had hope in God. Their hope wasn't in the things of this world. Oh, I have gone so far over time. Ah! Um, not looking for the world's answers, doing what is right. This passage says they do what is right. And then the other, I love this, that they're not driven by fear. Part of what made them beautiful is they weren't driven by fear. Who is that one that we can be spoken into, right? Um, Proverbs 30, 31, 25 says, strength and dignity are her clothing. That's what we want to clothe ourselves with, is this character. Um, on the Titanic, it said that there were 11 millionaires that were on the Titanic. One of them was Major A.H. A. Puchin. That's a great name. Um, he was rescued from the Titanic, but he said before, um, before it was going down, he realized that he left $300,000 in jewelry and securities and money in a box that was in his cabin. 
as things went down. And in that moment, he said the money was a mockery of his life. He had invested so much there, and then it was all just going to, going to, to, the, to the sea. <laughs> it had no valuable, no value. Um, and so it perished with the ship. And I use this because I think so often we're, we're investing in these things that ultimately, ultimately have no value in our outward appearance. They perish with the ship. But our soul, our character, these things live, and they will live far beyond the perishing of the ship right? So our outward beauty, beauty efforts, um, don't, we don't, we don't, we know that they go down with the ship. So we want to invest in the things that live beyond the Titanic taking a tank. Um, last thing, and I'm going to just go through this. It has a call to husbands and this call is powerful. It's to be considered. It's to treat women with respect. By the way, those things were not happening then. Don't act in the ways that are customary to your culture is basically what he's saying. You submit, he's saying to the husband, submit to me and love your wives. And what's interesting is we're even as wives called to do this even when they're non-believing husbands. So we know that um, this is, e they're called to this, but even husbands that don't do this, we're still called to yield our posture, right? Whew. Um, I just want to also say the husbands have a higher call and it's a greater responsibility and they'll have to give account for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so with that, I'm just going to say value, let's value what God values and submit our hearts to him first and foremost and let that play out in our marriages. Let me pray. Father, I... We want to hear you. <laughs> we want to know your heart for us. And you know, even as I was standing up here ch sharing this, I'm wrestling. I imagine there are women here wrestling. And Lord, if there is anything I have said that is not true, that is not your heart, that is not what you have for us, may you actually allow those things to just dissipate from our minds and hearts. Allow us to hear your voice. Allow us to hear from you. Father, we do want to be women who are ultimately submitted to you in every way. And then we're willing to submit to wherever you else you have us to submit in this world as an honor, as an, in honor of you, in, in an offering to you, in worship to you, to bring order to this world that you long for. Father, I just know there's so much work you want to do on my heart in this way. So I pray that rather than get into the minutia of what this necessarily, what's right or wrong, Lord, I pray that you would get into our hearts and change us. That you would move us toward your heart in greater and more significant ways. Father, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Christina. And thank you to uh, Ann and Terry's group for snacks today. They're beautiful out there. Um, thank you, Nancy May. Are you here? I didn't see Nancy May. So she clearly did not make coffee. So who's, who do I need to thank for coffee? Yvette, thank you for coffee. Oh, Nancy. Oh, yeah. OK. Thank you for the grounds, Nancy. Appreciate that. You're awesome. Um, next week, uh, Teresa Karens is on coffee, and Sherry and Terry's group is on snacks. And in, remember, in three weeks, we have our, um, what are we calling it, the service day with Children's Hunger Fund. And look for an email from Christina this week um, explaining a little bit more about that day. So go to your groups and enjoy your time.